And good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. I'm Pete Peterson, the Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, welcoming you here to the next in our Quest for Community webinar series. Today's topic toward a communitarian politics prospects for a bipartisan movement. Uh, so delighted to be joined by my friend, Eric Liu, moderated by another friend, uh, April Lawson in today's conversation. The Quest for Community series grows out of an initiative here at Pepperdine's Graduate Policy School called the American Project, which launched shortly after the national elections in 2016 as an attempt to explore uh, the future of American politics. It has resolved on a discussion and an argument in support of a more communitarian set of politics and policy. Uh, we do that through uh, webinars like this one, written pieces at uh, the website Real Clear Policy, as well as in-person events that we've hosted over the course of the last four years. If you'd like more information about the American Project, simply Google American Project and Pepperdine, and you'll be routed to the website which highlights all of the work that we've been doing here over the last four years. So this is the next again in our uh, Quest for Community webinar series, actually the sixth in this series. And I'm delighted to introduce first our moderator for uh, today, April Lawson, leads Braver Angels Debate and Public Discourse Program. If you're not familiar with Braver Angels, please check them out. Just doing incredible work in convening conversations across the country and across political divides. Uh, she actually designed the debates program, uh, which has grown from the first debate to serving over a thousand participants a month. She oversees a team of 50 volunteers and staff to administer all of Braver Angels debate work and as a lead voice in the public facing communications of that organization. Previously, she provided research and editing for David Brooks's uh, weekly columns at the New York Times and uh, co-founded and served as the associate director of Brooks's work at the uh, Aspen Institute Initiative, Weave, uh, the Social Fabric Project. Again, another great uh, organization, if you'd like to check them out. She's worked uh, for the federal government, the U.S. Treasury Department, uh, also in local government. We'll explore that today uh, at the New Haven Mayor's Office and as a senior consultant at Booz Allen Hamilton. Grew up in Kansas, studied anthropology at Yale, and now lives in the nation's capital. Eric Liu is the co-founder and CEO of Citizen University, which works to build a culture of powerful, responsible, and engaged citizenship in the United States. And I've just uh, been very fortunate not only to get to know Eric personally, but also the incredible work he does to build uh, civic infrastructure through the work of the civic collaboratories that he convenes on a regular basis uh, through Citizen University. He also directs Aspen Institute's uh, Citizenship and American Identity Program. Uh, he's the author of several excellent books, including The Accidental Asian, Notes of a Native Speaker, Gardens of Democracy, You're More Powerful Than You Think, a great book, uh, as they all are, but that one in particular as it relates to civic engagement and his most recent Become America Civic Sermons on Love, Responsibility, and Democracy. He's been selected as an Ashoka Fellow and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I've had the pleasure to serve on a uh, commission hosted by the American Academy on American Identity and Political Reform. Lou served as a White House speechwriter for President Bill Clinton and later as the President's Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor. He was later, later appointed by President Obama to serve on the board of the Corporation for National and Community Service. He and his family live in Seattle. Uh, just bravely me, Pete Peterson, uh, Dean here of Pepperdine's Graduate Policy School, done a fair amount of work in local government, uh, specifically through an institute here, the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement, which has uh, trained 
thousands of local government officials in how to lead more effective and inclusive public processes. Uh, that is now stretched into the world of technology where uh, we've also been doing work around leading smart communities. I serve on the leadership councils of the Public Policy Institute of California and the bipartisan nonprofit California Forward. I was a uh, Republican candidate for Republican uh, for a Secretary of State here in California. And as I often say, I ran for statewide office as a Republican in California, which is why I'm now Dean of a policy school here in this great state. And with that, uh, April, we'll uh, turn it over to you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Pete. And I just wanna thank you and uh, Eric, you as well for being here today. Um, how are you both doing? Good, 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 good. good. Yeah, wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, Pete, for that overview. Um, I didn't realize you were going to use my whole bio and actually read it. That's, <laughs> I, I sort of I wish I'd included this. Could have gone uh, for it. <laughs> Yes. Um, but uh, Eric's, of course, was, I'm sure, trimmed down substantially. But um, I'm curious, uh, why don't we start just at the very beginning? Um, so uh, the the, the title of our talk is Towards a Communitarian Politics, Prospects for a Bipartisan Movement. And I'm curious, and Pete, we'll start with you, like why that title? What is, what is this about? And in particular, what is it in response to that you see in America? So as I said at the beginning, uh, and first, just let me say how great it is to be on with both of you uh, and Eric, so glad to have you engaged in this conversation. Um, this webinar series grows out of an initiative here at the policy school I mentioned called the American Project, which started off as the American Project on the Future of Conservatism as a way of exploring the future of the conservative movement in the wake of the 2016 election. And as part of that work, uh, we, uh, co-director Rich Taffel and I convened a group of leading academics and policymakers on our campus here in Malibu in June of 2017 to have a discussion around what are, what, what are the future directions uh, or possible direction for the conservative movement. Uh, where we ended after the course of a long weekend was not at all where I thought we were going to go. Um, and to be specific about that, we definitely had people on various sides of the Trump question. We had various people uh, on different parts of the question around conservatism. We had social conservatives, libertarians, uh, people who were more on the economic sides of questions, those more on the social sides of questions. And where we ended up with, uh, really as a consensus among this group of 30 or so people, was that the challenges that we were facing as a country were not so much political, but they were cultural. And the cultural problems that we were uh, being, that we were dealing with, uh, were, were specifically around this issue of loneliness and alienation which we believed and continue to, the politics was both exacerbating these problems through tribalization, but also was a result of this loneliness. And so there was this weird tension that politics was, was both seen downstream of culture in that it was, we were, we were seeing as people identifying too much in these political tribes as a response to loneliness, but then by in so doing, they were actually, actually exacerbating the problem in, in disconnecting with one another. And so the work of the American Project over the last four years has really been exploring these issues around uh, revisiting what had been uh, a vibrant bipartisan conversation back in the 90s and very early 2000s, where you had people on the left and right exploring a more bottom-up, community-focused approach to not only politics, but also policy. Uh, because we, what we're responding to is something that we actually, I think, know much better now than we did 20 years ago, which are these issues around loneliness, uh, something that's now been described by the former Surgeon General as a public health crisis, not to mention issues around uh, economic impacts, um, and, and broader societal impacts of loneliness. And so that's what we're responding to. And we believe that a more communitarian politics, which we'll explore certainly um, in, in this hour together is, is actually perfectly fit to uh, 
um, respond to this moment known by its uh, loneliness and disconnection. Wonderful. And Eric, I'm interested, do you identify with the phrase communitarian politics? Like what does that mean to you? And, and how do you think about this, uh, the problem that we're responding to? Yeah, you know, I, uh, first of all, um, it is great to be with both of you. It's great to be part of this whole series. And Pete, um, you know, what you and Rich and others have catalyzed with the American Project um, is really um, something that should give people across the ideological spectrum some hope uh, right now, um, that there mm -hmm. can be serious, thoughtful, cross-partisan, cross-ideological exploration of some of what ails the body politic and maybe some of what can can heal it. And, um, you know, in that vein, um, the idea of communitarian politics does resonate with me. It has for the very decades that Pete described, uh, going back to the 90s when Amitai Etzioni at uh, George Washington University um, was really trying to coalesce uh, a, uh, an intellectual and um, a social movement uh, around that idea. Um, it captured part of my imagination back then. Um, but why I think it's particularly apt right now um, is, um, you know, in case you didn't realize from our bios, Pete and I do not share policy views uh, sure. up and down the line. We do not share uh, partisan preferences or electoral uh, choices necessarily. Um, but almost everything that Pete just described in his diagnosis of what ails us, uh, I would agree with um, that a big part of what is broken in our, not just our politics, but our, our, our culture um, um, is this uh, rampant epidemic uh, of hyper-individualism, mm. uh, uh, which is connected to isolation and loneliness and connected then to fragmentation and, and dehumanization. Um, and April, you know, I mean, I think your work that you and others are doing at Braver Angels is pitched exactly to trying to rehumanize a dehumanized politics. Um, but for us at Citizen University, um, we think about our, our work as trying to build a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship. And, um, and in many ways, uh, the, the cycle that Pete described there um, is at the heart of our theory of action and why it connects to this whole discussion today. Um, we often talk about how you know, we live in a time today um, where on the right and the left, there are a lot of sweeping proposals for structural change, um, whether that's on immigration policy or taxes or infrastructure or whatever it may be, healthcare. Um, and that's good. I cut my teeth many years ago working in DC um, on structure and policy and so forth. Um, but why I do what I do right now and why Citizen University exists um, is that we believe um, on a certain fundamental level that uh, culture is uh, upstream of structure, that culture precedes structure, um, that the values, norms, narratives, habits um, that add up to a culture uh, shape the frame of the possible when it comes to uh, structural political conversations. So if you have a hyper-individualistic, selfish, zero-sum, short-term, memoryless culture, um, then you're only going to be able to do so much on structural change uh, in either direction you might want to go, right? Um, and so uh, I grant completely intellectually the point that Pete, I think, made in passing, which is important, which is once that dynamic gets going, um, of course, structure then shapes culture too, and these things reinforce each other. But um, we've placed our bet as an organization, we've put our emphasis on trying to address culture. And one way to diagnose what's sick in our culture is not just hyper-individualism, but it is, it, it is this um, uh, kind of diseased vision of the meaning of liberty. Uh, mm -hmm. Liberty without responsibility, liberty without context. Um, you know, to use the language of Patrick Denis, um, mm -hmm. you know, liberty um, without a sense of um, the frame in which uh, liberty is made possible in the first place. Um, and I think that is um, one of the deepest challenges we have. And I think um, a politics and a culture that is about community uh, and about how do you rebuild um, bonds of trust and affection. Pete has heard me say that phrase a lot because one of the programs we run at Citizen University is something he mentioned called the Civic Collaboratory, which is a nationwide mutual aid club of civic innovators from all different sectors of civic work, all different parts of the ideological spectrum. Um, and that idea um, in our work is not just that we're networking and helping each other in projects, but on the base layer, we're building bonds of trust and affection. It's how Pete 
and I came to know each other. It's how Pete and I have come to be able to do work together um, is that we have that base layer of bonds of trust and affection. And I think that um, a politics that is tune, tuned more to community um, recognizes that um, we've got to attend to the things that form our values. We've got to attend to the institutions, habits and rituals uh, that shape our sense of how we're connected to the past and to one another. Um, and you know, one of the key phrases from the American Project's uh, initial report, A Way Forward, was a conservatism of connection. Um, and I would just posit that there is as much a hunger um, on my side of the aisle, so to speak, for a progressivism of connection. Mm. Uh, Americans mm. are hungry for connection right now. Mm. Um, and they will find it one way or another. They will find it in QAnon. Mm -hmm. Uh, they will find it in Antifa, they will find connection, meaning, belonging, and identity. Um, and our job is to try to find and create the most uh, uh, healthy, inclusive spaces uh, for that kind of connection as we can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I just, I realize this is probably overkill, but I'm really thrilled to be on this call with you guys. <laughs> like, I just, this is, I've believed this stuff since high school when I was like a lonely teenager in Kansas being like, it, it, you know, I went to a normal high school and so nobody else was reading political philosophy about community um, or Robert Nisbet or whatever, but this is just great. I, uh, so, so thank you already for what you've said. I'd like to, speaking of philosophy though, I'd like to get it down to the practical for a second. Um, so what would a politics that is attuned to community look like? So I heard um, attentive to, to norms and ritual and history. I heard, mm -hmm. you know, uh, both upstream and downstream of uh, culture is both upstream and downstream of, of politics and policy. Both these things are true, but let's let's see if we can make it a little mm -hmm. bit tangible mm -hmm. for a second. And so, I'm wondering if if each of you could share, um, like something that really would manifest that for you, either yep. something that you've experienced directly or that you would like to see. Well, I'll jump in first because much of my thinking around the importance of a more communitarian approach to our politics grows out of the very nonpartisan work I do at the Davenport Institute. I mentioned in the bio that uh, before becoming Dean here, I led this institute here at the policy school, which consults with local governments and how to make very difficult policy decisions from land use to water policy to public safety. And one of the things from doing that work for about 15 years that became apparent is one, uh, the partisan labels are difficult to apply to local issues, right? So if we're dealing now in a time where we are so known by the political labels that we bring to a relationship, one of the things that you learn when you do a lot of work at the local government level is that the partisan, you know, that, the, that old phrase, there's no Republican or Democrat way to fill a pothole, right? And in many ways, there's no Republican or explicit Democrat way to handle many issues around uh, local government that impact us deeply. And so in doing this work around the country, I invariably saw these issues where people in a coalition we're on the same side of an, a local issue, but would never vote at the top of the ticket the same way, right? And so not only were the issues themselves nonpartisan, they could still be polarizing, they could still be polarizing, but they were nonpartisan. And that you saw people come together in a way that uh, even though they would vote very differently on a presidential or national ticket, they came together in some very unique and creative and unexpected ways at the local level. So I'll bring just one example. I'll never forget working on a water policy issue up in far Northern California in a town called Eureka, California. Many people might think that Northern California is the Bay Area, but you can drive five hours North of San Francisco and you're still in California. That's Northern California. And Eureka had a very interesting issue uh, relative to the state of California in that they had too much water and they didn't know what to do with it. They actually had several pulp mills closed and they had about 60 million gallons a day of available water to them, if I remember that data point correctly. Now, if that problem or opportunity were any place else in California, I guarantee you they would know exactly what to do with that water. <clears throat> 
They would say, we'll take that water and we'll apply it to serving the population. But that problem in Eureka, California was an opportunity to return water to the ocean. And so when a number of people came in with various proposals for economic development, and then isn't this great, we can use this water, we can pipeline it to other communities in a parched California who need it. Everybody in Eureka was, that's not how we do things here. Frankly, we don't think, and I'll never forget this, we don't think anybody should live in Southern California because you are depriving the state of resources, environmental resources, that frankly, you, there just shouldn't be that many people living in Southern California. Now, there needs to be an allocation there, right? So built into the policy structure, there needs to be an allocation for Eureka to be Eureka. Mm. Even though the rest of the state would say, you guys are nuts. We really could use that water down here. Eureka was saying, no, we have a different set of priorities here. And so I think understood within this communitarian politics needs to be a framework that allows for Portland to be weird, right? That allows for Kansas City to be Kansas City and Seattle to be Seattle. And not only allows that, but allows the people living in those communities to celebrate that. And I think that's the part that sometimes even folks on my side of the aisle, when we talk about localism, one of the things, it's not just about the, the levers of federalism and localism and pushing decision-making down to the most local level. There needs to be an affinity created around what makes these places, places we love to live. Because I would, I would argue that we flipped the script sort of in saying that we forced us to identify most quickly as Americans before we identify ourselves more quickly as people who live in Seattle or DC or Malibu, California. And I would argue that if we can re energize, strengthen these muscles of local affiliation, we will get to those larger levels of identity that again, all to the end of building connection one to another. You know, April, I, I think the, um, if I can just jump in on, on your on your question, Please. I think yeah. the, the um, you know, how this looks practically and tangibly to me um, is in part, I, I would concur with what Pete's saying. And in part, I would, it's not even disagree, it's more um, um, append. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the um, I'm gonna give you one example from our work at Citizen University. And then just one example actually from um, uh, my, my life here as a citizen of Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. So in our work at Citizen University, one of our um, uh, pretty well-known programs is called Civic Saturdays. Uh, and, and these are gatherings that are essentially a civic analog to a faith gathering. Um, it's not church or synagogue or mosque, but it has the arc and the flow and the feel of such a gathering. And people, strangers in a place in a community are invited to come in and meet one another and, and talk about hard and challenging questions right off the bat. There's song, there's poetry, they're singing together and vocalizing together, which we don't do anymore as Americans. Um, there's readings of texts that you might think of as civic scripture. Um, not just the big ones like Gettysburg Address or I Have a Dream, but things that uh, uh, people are moved to want to draw from other, uh, you know, unsung parts of uh, what ought to be the American canon. Uh, and then there's a civic sermon at the heart of this, where someone speaks to try to make sense of the moment and tie together the ethical, moral, civic challenges of this time with what it means to live where we live, in our place, right? And... Um, we started these right after the 2016 election here in Seattle. Um, and then word got around and they kind of caught fire and um, we couldn't keep up with the demand just to bring Civic Saturdays to other communities. That's a super unscalable strategy. Um, and so we created a civic seminary program uh, to train catalytic people from towns all over the country to lead these gatherings themselves for their communities in ways that are tailored to their communities, right? And the, the bones are roughly the same every place you go. Um, but if you're in Brownsville, Minnesota, population under 500, um, or if you're in West Palm Beach, uh, Florida, 
uh, or if you're in the Central Valley of California, or if you're outside of Akron, Ohio, um, how you do Civic Saturday and how you invite people in, how you use this metaphor and this notion of democratic spirit and civic religion and so forth um, is going to differ. Uh, and some places will um, look just like Seattle and some places will look quite not like Seattle. Um, but the thing that we've learned in this work um, is twofold. Um, one, how hungry people are for connection and for an invitation. I mean, just a simple invitation, right? <laughs> will you come and join something, a ritual that's going to make you feel challenged a little better, not alone? Um, yes, I will. I'll come to that, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and, but number two, what we found is as a team, um, and you know, there are now over 100, 120 of these um, people we've trained in communities all over the country, and they are Republicans and Democrats, they are rural and urban, um, is the beauty of the pluralism um, of ways of expressing right. American ideals. Every Civic Saturday is meant to probe deeply on the meaning and the content of our creed. We are a nation bound together by little more than a set of words. And the only thing that animates us back to culture is whether we, how we together make moral sense of the words, liberty and justice for all, of the words, equal protection of the laws, right? Um, of the words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, not to come to unified unitary consensus, quite the opposite but to learn that in our pluralistic differences uh, and differing views of the meaning and the content of those words, um, to put it simply, what it means to be an American is to continually contest what it means to be American, right? Um, but you don't get to do that without practice and you don't get the practice without an invitation and you won't accept an invitation unless it's, unless it's with people you might know or trust because you're relationally bound to them, typically in a place where you are rooted, right? So. That to me is a picture of what communitarian, it's not even politics, communitarian culture um, can be like, right? But the second one that goes a little bit more to politics, and this is right up Pete's alley, because it's not partisan politics, it's not Republican Democrat, but in a local context, things can be just as polarized and polarizing, as he said. Um, and that is, I spent, um, you know, people look at my bio and what Pete just read and think, oh, well, you know, he's a White House guy, he got he cut his teeth, you know, in DC and the West Wing and all that. And sure, I did. Those were great years that I spent uh, um, in, in the other Washington. Uh, but uh, I would say that by far the greatest school of democracy for me has been being a citizen of Seattle over the last 20 and a half years um, and mm -hmm. being rooted in this place, committed to this place and responsible for this place in a way that I wasn't when I was younger, more transient and you know, really just kind of making a beeline to and from work every day you know, in DC. Um, and the critical example I want to use that's kind of a nice um, compliment to Pete's example of Eureka. Um, one of the first ways I showed up as a citizen here in Seattle was to serve on the, uh, as a trustee of the Seattle Public Library. Uh, and I happened to join the library board um, right after the city had approved a nearly $200 million bond measure to renovate or build or rebuild all of the city's libraries, the 26 branches and to build a brand new central library. Um, so I, I kind of got in at, at an interesting time because I hadn't had to be part of this, the, the campaign to pass that bond, but then I was there to join the board for, you know, for the implementation um, of that bond measure, which is called Libraries for All. And we undertook a process that sounds hokey, but it's completely Davenport Institute, like, you know, case study um, uh, called the hopes and dreams um, process, where we went to all 26 of the neighborhoods that either had or were going to get a library branch, um, and we had hopes and dreams meetings, and we invited people from the community, including people who are not typically invited to the meetings, and we had made it easy and accessible language-wise, translation-wise, childcare-wise, um, for people to come in and post on simple boards their hopes and their dreams for what that branch could look like, what kinds of materials it might have, what, what, what kinds of programming it might have, and what they didn't want to have happen, what they didn't like about the prior branch, and so forth. Um, and you might think, oh, well, that's very cute. That's, you know, li library stuff. Um, Seattle is a book crazy town. Seattle is a library loving town. And so people have as strong and polarized views about the point of libraries and, you know, what they're supposed to be for. And, uh, you know, as you might find on water rights in Northern California or Southern mm -hmm. California, right? Um, and the process that we went through uh, over a few years of listening 
not just like hopes and dreams, thanks, now we're gonna do what we want, but truly listening and then hiring architects and designers and programmers who could actually try to be responsive to the community um, was, was just at a level of commitment and humanization that frankly, my time in DC had never prepared me for. In DC, all of this stuff was talking points, all of this stuff was kabuki theater, all of this stuff was positioning. And yeah, sometimes you manage to ram something through and you had the numbers to break a filibuster and you could actually enact, or you might do an executive order, but really 80% of the time it was just talking about doing stuff. Um, mm. But here you were doing mm. stuff and you were doing stuff in a heterogeneous community, um, maybe not politically. I mean, this is a town that voted, I think 93% um, uh, democratic in the last presidential election, uh, but it, uh, but, um, you know, it's divided in other ways. And that experience that I had almost two decades ago, 15 years ago, is already a little bit ancient history because in the last decade, Seattle has undergone a convulsive change um, as Amazon has boomed, the tech industry has boomed. There've been this incredible influx of newcomers here. And there is not the same sense of community and place and rootedness. There is not the same sense of, um, there's a lot more of that DC spirit I was talking about having had as a young person now imported here to the tech campuses in the heart of the city. Um, and you got a lot of young, smart, super educated, very early prosperous and wealthy people come into town without necessarily that same sense of rootedness. Um, and we now face the challenge of trying to build a sense of community at a time where those that very same influx is exacerbating inequality, homelessness, um, the compounding effects of uh, pandemic. And, uh, and so, uh, again, we live in a laboratory right now of democracy that is just crying out for um, a communitarian spirit, not just to every, mm -hmm. every person for themselves, you know, get what you can, do what you want, um, and kind of hunker back down in your little, um, you know, loft or townhouse or whatever it might be um, that, that you work in, in your, in your kind of tech heavy community. Um, we're trying to create and recreate a sense of community um, in this place. Yeah, so that, um... Your answer, Eric, uh, has led us directly to a question that I kind of hoped we would get to. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna circle back to you first this time because I think it will, um, because I'm sort of asking because of what you've just said. I've been thinking about Civic Saturday, which is one of the most innovative, I mean, it, yeah, it's really one of the most innovative approaches I have seen to any of this work. Um, and it, to me, brings up the question of, so, You've both mentioned place, right? And um, it's uh, and beautifully so, right? And the I think that one of the things that America is suffering from is a loss of place. And I'm not the first one to say this, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that has led to these problems and to the breakdown of communities and uh, local institutions from the PTA to the bowling leagues, et cetera, is just mobility, right? Uh, so when people say society has uh, declined in whatever fashion, often that's not for reasons that are like good or bad. Mobility is just like, that's just technology, right? People can move for jobs in a way that they couldn't before. Jobs can be remote in a way that they couldn't before. So I think there's been loss of place. And uh, I loved what you said earlier, Eric, about how people will find connection and belonging somewhere. And so <laughs> we just have to hope we can create healthy versions for, of that rather than unhealthy ones. And that brings me to the question of, of theology. And so I have wondered if communities, particularly if they don't have place, have to be based on theology or shared values or something a little more abstract. And if so, uh, and that, right, again, helps us make sense of the decline in community over the last 50 or so years, because it parallels the decline in institutionalized religion, particularly in participation in the institutions of, institu of, of traditional religion. And so I'm curious uh, if either of you think that community does have to be based on theology, and if so, how we then, well, I guess there's one question about can civic theology be as good as traditional religious theology better? Like, how do those two relate? Um, and and then I would also offer um, one more prompt for this, just sort of input into this question, which is, it seems like, and Pete, you were saying this earlier, that politics uh, has generated in the vacuum of theology left by traditional religion to some degree, right? Politics has risen to fill that void on both sides. And so how do we create um, 
if you agree with this, how do we create theologies that are sticky enough, compelling enough, uh, feel righteous enough, right, to, to bring in uh, the folks who are going to QAnon or the folks who are the young folks or, you know, the folks who want to be part of making a better world? And, and can we do that in a way that's genuinely welcoming uh, for all, both traditionally marginalized communities and the po folks who hate the word privilege? Um, so that was a giant question. Yeah. Uh, Eric, well, take your. Uh, I, I really appreciate the question on multiple levels. And, you know, I, I think you named in passing this um, critique that I, I think I hear on both the left and the right, but I hear it probably more on the right these days than the left. This line that um, it's dangerous when people start treating politics like religion. Um, and you see what's happened, you know, with this kind of. Um, you know, righteous rage and cancel culture and all, all this other stuff. And I, I actually don't fully um, buy that critique or, or let me say, I think that critique is revealing. It's revealing about the premise of what those critics think religion is. Mm. I don't think, and, and let me say actually at the outset, I was not raised in any um, formally religious tradition. Um, I, uh, but I am like so many people here in my town of Seattle in that category that's ever growing around the country of spiritual but not religious, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't, I wasn't raised in a church, but I have built a, um, a world, a value system drawn from different traditions of the world, whether it is um, Christian traditions. Um, I'm deeply influenced by um, Jewish education and learning. I'm shaped by Zen Buddhists. I'm shaped by um, people of, you know, uh, a lot of deep conversation and reckoning with um, Jesuit tradition, um, and, you know, those have all shaped the way that I think about the world and our responsibilities to one another. Um, but across all those traditions, um, when people say, oh, you don't want politics to become like religion, because then it's going to be just endless war, I say, boy, that's a sad picture of what you think religion is. I don't think religion is endless war. I think I don't think religion is righteous crusades of um, you know, uh, wiping the other side off the face of the earth. Um, I think religion is doubt. I think religion is seeking of meaning and purpose. I think religion um, is um, seeking a salve and comfort um, when we face the existential loneliness of our existence. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, for those who find um, that find ways to address those needs through godly religion, through um, you know, that pathway, great. Literally, God bless, right? <laughs> uh, but, for, but for those who do not, um, uh, you know, for all those people who, when we all know them, you know, who say yoga is my religion or Peloton is my religion or baseball is my <laughs> religion or whatever, when they say that, they're speaking about something that, again, a human need that needs to be filled, right? Um, and for me, I think about civic religion, not as a substitute or a displacement of godly religion, uh, nor frankly, as, a, as an answer to the people who um, are atheists and, and, uh, and just need something, right? Um, as I've said in many contexts, whether you believe in a God or in the absence of a God, civic religion is for you in the United States because we are a creedal nation. Hmm. And the in this, I think it's true in any context, but especially in the American context, democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. Constitutions are not magic. Pieces of paper are not magic. If they were, the Articles of Confederation would have been enough, right? <laughs> what is the magic is our mutual belief, our belief in each other, our belief in norms, our belief in a culture and a set of mores that are about infinite repeat play and forbearance and not trying to just total victory and dis and crush the other side in, in a righteous fury, right? Um, and I think that that is a set of values and dispositions. You, you use the word theological, but I would say they are spiritual. They are civic spiritual. They are what John Dewey referred to when he spoke of democratic spirit. They are what Robert, Robert Bella spoke of uh, uh, when he, quoting Tocqueville, spoke of habits of the heart. Right? I think the ways in which Tocqueville diagnosed the, the, the dynamic from hyper-individualism, egoism to loneliness to um, ripeness for despotism uh, was exactly right. And we got to break that cycle by giving people mm -hmm. a civic basis 
for shared meaning making and shared responsibility taking. And if you still want to go to church, if you still have a deep life in your mosque or your synagogue, that's awesome. And if you still think all that stuff is foolish, great, fine for you. But in the meantime, show up in your community and your neighborhood and your country and figure out how can we build trust, relationship, a sense of equity and justice for each other, right? And I think that is, um, that is how we at Citizen University think about civic religion, right? It is not about dogmatism. It is not about um, uh, unquestioning faith. Uh, it is not about certitude. Um, it is actually in the words of Judge Learned Hand, um, you know, in his famous speech on I, uh, I Am an American Day in the, I think, 1945 or 40, uh, uh, yeah, 1944, um, he said, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure it is right, mm. right? And I think that um, if we can embrace that um, in the very spirit of this, not just this conversation today, but the whole American project and the whole, this webinar series, uh, um, and the spirit of braver angels for that matter, um, mm -hmm. then, then we are practicing citizens in that civic mm. religious sense. You know, mm. this is about practice. Um, every, every faith is about practice. It's not about repetition of the words. It's about how you show up and do. Thank you. And I, I, I do just want to mention that I, I wasn't trying to invoke a critique that depends on theology per se. Um, if you'll forgive my cheeky little joke, it sounds like civic Saturdays are spiritual, but not religious, just like you. <laughs> and I, um, but I, and, and I actually think that's entirely right. At Braver Angels, I have long thought that we're teaching spiritual skills. Um, we call them communication skills. We call them all sorts of other things, but they actually are that. Um, and yeah, so that's very compelling. Um, Pete, what do you think? Do communities have to be based on, let's say values um, or a, a compelling vision that calls people forth? And if so, what does that require? Yes, I, I approach this as what I would describe as a more orthodox uh, Christian believer. Um, and in that, I this question around theology to me has three parts. One, one would be perspective. Uh, the second would be posture. And the third would be behavior. So the perspective, uh, to quote, uh, the late political philosopher uh, Eric Vogelin is that we are not about immunitizing the eschaton. Didn't think we were going to get that phrase in today, Eric. I... Um, <laughs> but there is there is there is please. something about not just Christian theology, but all I think the major religions, which says that this is not all there is. Uh, Tocqueville at one point talks about the, the civic importance of religion. One of the reasons that religion is so important to a democratic republic is that it always puts the, the final results of our efforts beyond our lifetimes. I think if there's anything that this current political co culture can be indicted for, it's that thinking that every single policy debate is uh, is going to wreak either uh, eternal damnation or the sunlit uplands of some heavenly society. And I think a right reading of all the great religions, in my case, Christian, would be to say, we have in front of us things to do. We have a calling placed upon us. And we are to do that without necessarily believing that we are the ones that are going to necessarily realize or avoid heaven or hell on this side of uh, life. So that's that's the perspective. The posture, uh, and this is, you know, there, there can be different ways of viewing this, even in the Christian religion, but it's more the way, I'm more Niburian in my view that, that there is a certain irony to life. And, uh, I've just seen too many things in my own work in local policy, not to mention national politics, that show that even the best of intentions sometimes can deliver what is known by uh, economists as unintended consequences. And so there's a, there's, a there's a posture in our political engagement that understands that even what we construe to be our best intentions may not be pure, may not be pure, um, but we are nonetheless called to pursue those things. 
and to understand that those we come into contact with uh, are also creatures of God that are doing what we hope is the best that they can do as well. And that we don't have a full perception of what's going on in our world. We only have a partial perception. And I think this is so important as a in having a perspective, which I think is grounded in, a, in an orthodox uh, Christian theology, much less many other world religions, which is to say we are fallen creatures uh, doing the best that we can. And there is only one that has the full picture of what is going on, not only in our lives, but in, 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 in this time that we've been called to live in. And that should engender humility, which is the predominant important civic virtue. Uh, maybe alongside courage, which I think is, is something that I think is necessary for this time. But courage and humility, I think, are, are grounded in a right theology. And then finally, behavior. Um, the social science shows us that those that who are uh, most often um, deeply involved in their places of, of faith, again, across religions, also tend to be the ones that are more directly involved in other ways within more broadly known as civic engagement. People of faith tend to be the highest, uh, those that, that vote most regularly, tend to be the ones that give most directly, not only to religious causes, but even more broadly civic and secular causes. They tend to be the ones that volunteer, not just in their church or synagogue or mosque, but they also volunteer in business organizations and other civic uh, organizations as well. And so there's a behavior piece of this as well, which I think speaks to a theology of engagement that as Tocqueville would say in the kind of schoolhouses of democracy, he saw churches and participating in local churches and leadership as being a proving ground and a preparatory ground for then running for local office and getting more broadly engaged in your in your town or city. And so I think those three pieces, it's it would be very difficult to pull apart the importance of uh, of a theology with a with a more broadly understood civic theology. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I uh, want to remind this conversation could clearly go on for quite some time. It looks like you may have a response, Eric. I um, I want to invite all of our listeners and viewers to go ahead and submit questions. Uh, you can do that in the chat via, yep. Um, so thank you, Melissa. Melissa has uh, put in the chat. Please feel free to type your questions here and send them to her and we will ask them. Um, while you're thinking, I want to ask one more uh, and then uh, we'll see what comes in from other folks. Um, and that is, so Pete, the, what you just said highlighted something interesting, which is it seems sort of like you said that people who are more likely to attend to be involved in religious institutions are also more likely to be involved in a series of other kinds of institutions. And so, Eric, to come back to your theme of alienation, I um, it sort of seems like there are people who are in, still connected to institutions and people who are not. Uh, and that if you're connected to one kind of institution, you're probably connected to several others too. And by the way, you probably have a better community that correlates with better life outcomes, yada, yada. Um, and so my question is, how do we speak? Uh, I'll add one more thing, which is, so Braver Angels uh, works to, to bring together what we call reds and blues across the partisan divide at the grassroots level. And uh, someone said something important to me recently about why we, like most groups like us, struggle to bring in people on the extremes. Uh, so people of color, um, social justice uh, oriented folks on the left, uh, people who um, support President Trump are planning to get vaccinated, et cetera, on the right. We have these sort of stereotypes and I know it's more complex than that, but um, they said to me, uh, and actually this was Tim Schreiber commented that the kind of work that all of us do uh, tends to not speak to those folks' pain points. Those folks are often um, oriented towards, their problem isn't that it's a world that's falling apart, communities falling apart. Their, their sense of their problem is that there's, they're facing an unjust world. And so I'm curious how we can make a communitarian politics speak to people mm -hmm. whose fundamental problem is justice. Um, and 
you know, we can throw in the added fact that their narratives about justice directly contradict each other or not. But um, how do we how do we make that uh, the, our way of thinking um, resonate to to folks like that? Slash, what do we have to learn from them? Eric, you know, I first. think that's a great yeah. question, April, and um, it brings out um, at least one word, maybe two, that we haven't yet used in this conversation today. The first one is power, um, and so mm -hmm. you know, a big chunk of what at Citizen University, we, we, we have this mock equation that power plus character equals citizenship. That citizenship properly understood, I don't mean documentation status, I mean the kind of ethical sense of being a member of the body, requires both a fluency in power, understanding who decides stuff, how that came to be, what the sources of power, whether it's money, people, ideas, force, um, are in a given place and community and how you can change that allocation and, uh, and, and write yourself into that map of power. Um, but that literacy and power, while necessary, is insufficient, that it must be coupled with a grounding in civic character, um, not character as um, individual virtue, honesty, and diligence, and so forth. Th those are important. But I mean character in the collective, how we live in community and hold a community together, mm -hmm. values of mutuality and reciprocity and sharing of burden and sacrifice. and some of what Pete was saying, just kind of an understanding that this is a relay race, not a, not, not, not a one round thing. Um, and so our sense of stewardship uh, in, in that context. Power plus character equals citizenship um, is a helpful frame because when you think about a communitarian, a more communitarian society, a society that is less about hyper individualistic, atomized, lonely, isolated, alienated, angry people, finding their quote unquote community in online you know, groups and so forth. Um, uh, you can't simply, you know, the Civic Saturday helps scratch the itch of character and a sense of meaning and a sense of, um, you know, ethical, spiritual exploration with others. Um, but that alone uh, is also not enough, that you've got to be able to couple it with an understanding of power and power imbalance and how it is that we got here um, and the pain points. I slightly would disagree with Tim's characterization. I think plenty of people who show up at Civic Saturdays or who come to Braver Angels are in pain. Uh, they, they, they are in pain. Mm -hmm. There is pain everywhere in our country uh, because of grinding inequality, because of this dislocation and disappearing sense of place, because of a pandemic. Uh, uh, you know, and, and so um, I think um, our ability um, in these settings to create a, again, a non-destructive way for people to reckon with their pain and to share with others a sense of, to quote a great report I recently read, a way forward, right? Um, like how do, we, how do we make our collective life not simply the serial display of our narcissistic pain, but actually the conversion of that pain into collective commitment mm -hmm. to each other, mm -hmm and to our larger project, right? And in so doing, we will have arguments about what mm -hmm. the good is and what the right way is to go forward. But, um, but we will get that you win some and you lose some because that's how it works in a democracy, right? And, um, and I think that that approach and that, that um, it's not even a mindset, it's a heart set um, mm -hmm. is something that we've got to be cultivating far, far more. And you know, the, the last thing I wanna say here uh, on this is um, when, Pete was talking about localism, you know, and you could hear me and talking about Civic Saturdays and the kind of wonderful diversity, wildflower diversity of how these things are blooming in different parts of our land. Um, I'm not for localism alone, right? I'm for what I've called in a different context, networked localism. Like we, we live in a time and here, you know, my, I, I was one of the people very active in ensuring that Seattle became the first large city in the country to enact a $15 minimum wage. Um, and we did so not just in Seattle for Seattle, we did so in a web of relationship and playbook sharing and um, organizing with people like us in lots of other cities around the country and not just the big obvious blue ones in Kansas City, um, you know, in Omaha, in other places uh, um, where people were trying to reckon with power and injustice, imbalances of power, concentrations of power, um, that have left them feeling cut out, right? And I think that is the thing, like people feel the game is rigged on the right and the left today because in many ways the game is rigged. And so 
Um, you, when you see that the game is rigged, you face a very simple choice here, which is in the first place, a choice of fate. Do I believe I can actually, with the help of others, unrig this game? If your answer to that is no, as it is for tens of millions of Americans, yeah. then screw this. Then I'm checked out. I'm not voting. This is just this is just for the lols. Hilarious what Trump did. Hilarious what's happening over here. Oh, I love the chaos of what happened to the Capitol. Ha ha ha. Just that kind of nihilism of no responsibility, um, which grows itself from pain, from a pain so severe that it's just led people to deaden every nerve. Um, of responsibility taking, right? But if you make the other choice to say, I actually do still, in spite of all the all the evidence around me, believe that it's possible to change things, that's a great starting point, right? And that is a starting point of Black Lives Matter. It is a starting point of a lot of people who voted for Trump, not once, but twice, and many of them after voting for Obama, right? Um, and uh, I, I do not want anybody on either of those sides to completely dismiss and dehumanize their opposite number. Because mm -hmm. in that instinct is a need for belief that it's possible for us to do something together. And um, again, I'm not naive. Things can be in some ways zero sum, but um, my friend Heather McGee, who formerly ran Demos and has a book of bestseller list right now called The Sum of Us, um, is all about how on matters of race and on matters of class in the United States, we've got to get out of zero sum thinking. Um, zero sum thinking kills every one of us. Um, and I think um, being honest about power and injustice um, is a really important place to start so that people know you're not just saying la la fancy philosophical stuff, but you're getting real about how people are hurting. Mm -hmm. Pete, uh, I'd love for you to address the same question. I'm realizing that we're running a little short on time and I want to get a couple uh, viewer questions in too. So yeah. Um, if you could just quickly tell us how we can solve all of this, that would be great. Sure, I'll do it in three minutes. Um, uh -huh. First, I would say that um, I think it's important first to, to recognize as much as many of our national political debates are around some of these issues around justice, how they're actually meted out and even decided are at local levels. And so whether it's you know, in Eric's view, uh, $15 minimum wage. I can think of a lot of places where if that were a national policy, it would have rather adverse effects on employment. Uh, but in a Seattle, I could argue that it probably does make sense. Um, certainly we, we, we see a trial now for this Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin in the murder of George Floyd, these issues around public safety are very local. The opening or closing of schools, these are being done at a local level, right? And so sometimes I think politics has become in some ways a spectator sport when we deal with it at a national level in a way that if we acknowledge that even in these issues around justice, uh, that these issues are actually being decided. I'm not just talking about power but there is also legitimate power making those decisions. There are legitimate elected bodies. There are legitimate appointed bodies. There, there may be illegitimate influences on those bodies, but suffice it to say, it's up, up to each of us to understand where those influences are. Then I would say that, again, more the, the posture of communitarianism has to start with a position of love. And that is gonna sound very squishy but I have to say, you know, no one less than Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his I Have a Dream speech and in so much of his, he was calling Americans to be Americans, rightly understood. And I think in so many of these issues that we're dealing with, even locally, a lot of the training that I do with local government officials is to say the reason why some of these, why the public doesn't like you is they don't believe you love Santa Monica the way they love Santa Monica. They think you're coming in with this solution pulled from some very technocratic study somewhere and you're dropping it. You're doing policy to people and not with people. And where you're going to be able to make that nexus in turn is when you as a public official can convince that local resident 
that even with the changes you're proposing, you love this town as much as they, they do. And you understand why they love it. And once you can make that connection out of love, you get people who are resistant to change more willing to accept it. But if this is going to just be about America was founded out of original sin, this town has always been, you know, whatever the, whatever the history has been, that there's nothing inherently good about this place. You're going to have a hard time making change. Mm -hmm. Unless we can introduce what I think we all acknowledge to one degree or another is at least a love for the local place where we live. Before we even love our country, I think we can acknowledge that we love the local place, even with its foibles and faults. But we are not going to get to these places. To me, this is change management, conflict management has to come out of love in the places where we live. And it's important for the government side to understand it. And it's important for the, the citizen or resident side to understand that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the good news here is that I feel like we're succeeding at, at finding some some prospects for a bipartisan movement. Um, I wanna lift up a practical question from one of our viewers, which is, uh, so Eric, you talked about power. How do you, and, and I think I have one for you, Eric, and then one for you, Pete. Um, how do you diffuse community gatherings where certain people may want to use the gathering for their own political agenda? Yeah, look, I think th this is, um actually a great question for the Davenport Institute and Pete in terms, you know, Pete and I, one of our early um, collaborations was uh, a, a set of conversations on reinventing the public meeting, reimagining the torture chamber that so many public <laughs> meetings at every level of government in the United States often are, right? Uh, everybody gets two minutes of public comment. It's just a parade of stuff until the one guy gets up there and just grabs the mic and hijacks the whole, you know, conversation and so on and so forth. And the, you know, the iron butt council members just sit there in silence till it's all done. And then they do what they mm -hmm. were gonna do anyway, right? It's just this horrible experience. And, um, uh, and so Pete has more, I think, to say about that and the innovations that are actually happening um, just in California alone, let alone the rest of the country. And I'm not talking tech innovations. I just mean like, right. you know, the, fundamentally the answer to the question is, these are design questions, design mm -hmm. thinking, right? We should not take as a given any way, anything about the ways in which we engage in public policy and public life. These meetings are designed in a way that currently um, allow for that kind of domination or hijacking, and they can be redesigned in a way that allows for something far more inclusive and pluralistic um, and far more generative. Um, and, you know, uh, and that's what's true of public meetings is also true of civic rituals. We put a lot of thought into how we try to design civic Saturdays mm. and other gatherings um, so that people feel like they are not just spectators, um, but, but are co-creators. And um, But I think Pete probably has more to say on that. But I just say, yeah, that is very much the work of the Davenport Institute is to improve public meetings. Uh, if there's anything true of how we typically do public engagement at the local level, it it contradicts just about every principle of effective public engagement. Uh, we invite people to overcome their greatest fear, which is public speaking. And there are only two kinds of people that can overcome that fear. <laughs> those who are good public speakers or whack jobs. Mm -hmm. And in that there is uh, something that I think dissuades people from going to public meetings that are set up in that way. And so, yeah, much of the work that we do is around facilitation and process design, just as Eric said. And the goal is one, to make sure that every resident has a chance to feedback. If it's just about the three minutes at a microphone, you are gonna dissuade a lot of voices from participating. And so you need to be able to break up groups in a way that not only provides diversity within those conversations, but also provides opportunities for people to participate uh, in those smaller groups. And so if you're always placing the emphasis on maximum participation, uh, you're going to be, you should be in a good place no matter what side of the issue that you might be on. Because invariably, and this is certainly true of our national politics, 
we tend to think in bubbles and exist in bubbles where very rarely do we interact with somebody who thinks very differently than we do, much less is a neighbor <laughs> and, and also has just as much of a vested interest in the outcome of this school reform or public safety reform or land use reform as, as we do. And so creating spaces through design or through the use of technology that allows for that. Um, there are a number of different ways to do that. But again, the emphasis is on getting away from the three minutes at a microphone model and focusing on different ways that you can uh, both connect people with others who you disagree with, do it in a way that's civil, uh, but also at the same time provide opportunities for everybody to engage in conversation and then report it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I just want to let viewers know that uh, I will get to as many questions as possible. Uh, I won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, so we'll do uh, hopefully one or two or maybe maybe three more. Um, so the next one I want to offer is uh, speaking of, of um, echo chambers and, and bubbles that we're all in, uh, how do you reach people who are believing conspiracy theories? I know this comes up a lot in, in our work because um, we run debates where people have a lot of different facts. Um, and uh, this time, Pete, I'll start with you partly because I would imagine that you had to uh, engage this pretty directly when this was framed around conservatism. We do. Not that there's well, only conspiracy theories there, but go ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, I think conspiracies and conspiracy thinking is really more of a mindset that's in response to this crisis of loneliness. It's a way of making sense of a very turbulent world. Um, and it's something that we can see at the local level too. There are conspiracies at the local level about the way decisions were made 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago that are not true, but because they've just been consistently told it's important to intersect with those. Now, again, the focus of the work, at least in the Davenport Institute, which I think in many ways connects directly with the American project, is that it's very easy to get away with conspiracy theories on issues that you, no matter what, really have no impact in deciding, right? If you have a QAnon conspiracy about the way Washington DC is run, Chance, you've really got no way of dealing with, with the actual issue, even if you interact with somebody who has that level of conspiracy. Or if you think that, uh, you know, that conspiracy can be at a more local level, now you're getting at a place where uh, the conversations, I think, become much more personal. And you tend to have people, again, that because we, we tend to be much more invested in the outcome of decisions at the local level, and you tend to have people that not only have their own facts, but can at least share some identity with a community in which they live, there's a greater opportunity for conversation there and a way of exploring where those uh, conspiracies come from. But I don't think we should, um, I don't think we should be naive to the fact that these conspiracies are born out of people's desire to make sense of a very, as I said before, a turbulent world. As somebody, I was in New York on 9-11. There's still people that have conspiracies about how that went down. And in some ways I think about that as being one of those, one of those events that if you lived anywhere near New York, there was just no way you thought something like that could happen. And so how do you make sense of that? You either take the facts as they're I think justly presented, or you come up your, with your own way of, of trying to make sense with, of it. But I, I think it is worth, especially at the more local level where, there, where again, conspiracies can be present, talking these issues through because you still have to come to a decision at the end. That's where some of these national conspiracies are so frankly spectator sports. I know I want to make sure we have time for one more question, but the only quick thing I'll add to what Pete said, uh, you know, in addition to conspiracy thinking being the product of this kind of loneliness and isolation, it is also the product of the power illiteracy that I was describing earlier. 
Um, most Americans today have no earthly idea how most decisions in public life get made. Mm. Um, and that's the fruit of a lot of things, the decline in civic education uh, over the last generation and a half, um, the, the distancing of and scale of government uh, in a way that makes people feel um, that th things are being decided far away from them, either geographically or in power terms. Um, and so um, when you, when you are alone and lonely and isolated, and when you have no idea how things got decided that are impacting you and making your life feel painful, um, it's actually a super rational response to mm -hmm. start making up stories, right? And, um, and I think to answer the question directly, we have to address both those things. We have to, you know, if you know someone who is in the thrall of a conspiracy um, about things, um, it can't, that person cannot be argued out of it through rationality, right? And through a presentation of more piles of facts. It's got to <laughs> begin with trust and just a humanizing, like what is the source of the, the yearning, the need, the pain that leads you emotionally to gravitate to this? Let's get to talk about that. And I can tell you about my own, um, you know, such emotional dynamics that lead me to understand and empathize with that. And then number two, Let's, let's learn together a bit about power and like who actually decides this stuff. And once you actually peel that onion or you know whatever your metaphor is and you realize it's not some vast them out there, right? Most people think in politics and civic life, uh, the answer of who decides is they. I can't believe they decided A, B, C, D, right? But there is no they. Once you actually start examining it, it's this particular group of people. It's this particular body. It's this particular group of people who may not be elected, but maybe are influencing the electeds. Um, but in the end, it's not mystery or um, unknowable. And the more we can learn and feel a sense of command about that, the less we will be prone to um, the reflex of conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And, and one of the things I appreciated in both of your answers is that you honor folks who believe in conspiracy theories. One of the, uh, I don't know, small crusades I suppose I'm on is just that we talk about those conspiracy theory wackos is that we don't engage our own narratives with a lot of emotion <laughs> and a lot of the same needs. So thank you both for that. Um, so the the final viewer question I'll ask is uh, and and let's I, I think we'll we'll have to make this the final question for the event as well uh, is um, how so specifically it's directed at Eric whether uh, whether you had to change your civic Saturdays to an online to online events due to COVID. I'd like to broaden it also to um, how do we do all this online, right? Like, how do we do this uh, in, and so both in the particulars with regard to Civic Saturday and then more generally, how do we, how do we handle this? Uh, so we'll start mm -hmm. with you, Eric. We, we used to believe at Citizen University, like as an article of faith, like do things in person, online yeah. is terrible. Like you got so it. Did we. Um, and, uh, and the pandemic has actually been a great education for us. We were forced to um, flip that around. And uh, I would say, and so Civic Saturdays are happening online on Zoom. Um, they're being broadcast on YouTube and other platforms um, all around the country, both the ones that we run um, from Seattle, but also ones that all of our Civic Saturday fellows um, who we've trained are doing. And I'll say there's, there's something, of course, there's something missing when we're doing it this way. Um, the serendipity, the, um, just the human sense of connection, the actual singing together, it's hard to do on Zoom. Um, but, uh, but there is actually something net positive also about um, this platform, which is it's focusing. We are with each other. If you invite people when they come to a Civic Saturday, as we do, leave your cameras on. Don't lurk. Don't kind of, you know, like be present, see each other. Um, and then we break people into small groups as much as possible. Um, there is something that is still incredibly almost intense about connecting this way with each other if you design it um, for that purpose. And so um, Google Civic Saturdays, go to our website, citizenuniversity.us, wherever you are in the country, you'll probably find an opportunity to plug into one soon. And hopefully soon enough, we'll be back to doing these. Uh, there have been some that have been in person all along the way um, in so socially distanced safe ways, but uh, primarily they've, they've gone online for now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just add that I, I think this is an experience we're seeing in local governments around the country that their committee and council meetings have moved to online. It's provided new opportunities for people to see what actually happens uh, behind the curtain, so to speak. There actually is no curtain to go to Eric's point before. It's all there. You could show up on a Tuesday night in most places to do it. But 
online has facilitated more people engaging and a lot of the local leaders that I see are seeing a lot more people attending the online council and committee meetings than, than in person. I would just say that I, maybe as a way of closing is that nothing is going to replace in person. We are, we are communal people that need to understand one another uh, directly. And the ability to pick up nuances and body language and intonation and relationship building that just happens otherwise. I do think that as we come, we see the light at the end of this pandemic tunnel, that one of the great questions facing the country, much less our communities, is how can we make the most out of this technology, which has now connected us in some new ways, but how do we understand the importance of our actually meeting and being in person? Hmm. Um, and, and are we gonna find new ways to actually do that as much as we're thinking about ways in which Zoom and Microsoft Teams or whatever can also facilitate that as well? My, my hope is that we have a new appreciation of the importance of being with one another in person, physically, um, and and I think that. it's for that reason that, the, that we're going to have a roaring twenties for communitarianism. Uh, you bet. So. You bet. To, to Amen. Close it, to Maybe. close it back on the theme, I think that uh, what Pete just described, uh, there's a yeah. lot of pent up desire for people to make meaning, make community, and make belonging back together again. Absolutely. Amen. Well, thank you both. Amen. Exactly. That's what I said. <laughs> or if you have a different word, that's okay too. Um, <laughs> a women. Anyway, I, uh, yeah, thank you both so much for being here. And um, to all of our viewers, thank you. Uh, I hope you, you learned something. I know I learned a lot. And yeah, I'm living this, seeing a lot of innovation ahead and, and a lot of hope. So Thanks thank so you much, all. Thanks uh, so much to both of you and uh, to Pepperdine for um, bringing us together. Really glad to be on this journey with you all. I would just add at the end that all of you who've registered are going to get a link to this recording afterwards. And just as a way of, if this was a, a set of messages that you thought was important to share the video out. This is the way that we grow the impact. This is going to appear on our YouTube channel. I have no doubt that given the way that our other quest for community webinars have been seen by thousands, that uh, certainly this conversation may as well. So it's, uh, Look for your inbox to get the link to this recording. And again, feel free to share it out and stay tuned for our next uh, American Project event. So thanks so much to both of you. All right. Thank you. Thanks.